heart, you quoted me just saying, Dr. House said there is no God, you've taken me out of context. But you can find another guy who says there is no God. And if you read what he says in context, that's what he believes, there is no God. So context is important. Another is twisted translation. In 1961, the Jehovah Witnesses published their New World Translation of the Bible. It is crowded with twisted translations of the biblical text without any linguistic justification. An example of this can be found in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is, in, he is the image of the invisible God, <coughs> speaking of Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. Because by means of him, all, and notice what they do, they put other in the text, in brackets here. Things were created in the heavens and upon the earth. All other things have been created through him, for him. Also he is before all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. The other's not in the Greek. If Paul wanted to say that he could have used the other the word other in Greek, he chose not to. Paul is not saying other th He's saying that Jesus is in fact the creator of all things. The only way you wouldn't believe that Jesus is the creator of all things is if you believe he's a creature. So their theology dictates the translation. <clears throat> now, the next example of a wrong way to use scripture <clears throat> is, um, is using the scripture as a hook, which is not unusual for uh, uh, some preachers. Who, the Bible, all the Bible is for their sermon is a hook. Their, their, their interest is not expositing the scripture. They want to use the scripture as a hook for what they want to talk about. It's important we don't do that. It's important we stay in the text and read the text and explain the text. Quoting the scripture first in order to grasp the attention and to lend the credibility to the cultist argument. Can you imagine a preacher getting up and just starting off saying, I just like talking about something and take 30 minutes in the pulpit and give his views and say, well, okay, it's time to dismiss. If you did that a few Sundays, you think the church, most of the church would be uh, concerned about it? Does he have a word from God? Well, see, what he does, he first of all quotes something. He doesn't plan on saying much about it, but he just quotes it as a hook, springboard, and then he goes off to talk about what he wants to talk about. It. In my opinion, if you do not expose the scripture, you might as well even use the Bible. <clears throat> so what happens, you have a pretext for the cultist's own views, usually with the verse having been taken out of context. Uh, for example, Mormons use Joseph Smith's supposed recognition of the Bible's authority <clears throat> in order to authentic authenticate his peculiar vision in the woods and a doctrine of God the Father having a body of flesh and bones. They never tire of pointing out that before going into the woods, Joseph Smith allegedly prayed for wisdom to distinguish truth from error from the many denominations that proliferated, proliferated, talk, proliferated uh, upstate New York in his first half of the 19th century. He used James 1.5 as a pretext to advance his heretical doctrine about God. What does James 1.5 talk about? <clears throat> you read the passage? If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, he gives to all men liberally and does not hold back. But if you read that passage in context, it's talking about when you're under time of tribulation and difficulties, you can't figure out what to do, you ask God for wisdom. Wisdom about what? Wisdom about whether he's Trinity or not? No, wisdom about how to deal with the trials that you have. And if you do that, then God will give you sufficient information how to solve how to, how to deal with the trials and, and survive through the trials. It's not a blanket statement of asking God for information. And, uh, and yet he uses that as a pretext to his heretical doctrines about God. <clears throat> Ignoring immediate context, in our example above regarding the Mormon practice of baptism for the dead, 
the Mormons would read the immediate context of that verse, so we discover that Paul's main topic of discussion is resurrection, not baptism. By ignoring the immediate context, they fall in the snare of their own devising. How about collapsing context? <clears throat> this method of misreading scripture entails treating two or more texts together as if they were related. Here's a good one. Judas hung himself. Go thou and do likewise. What thou doest, do us quickly. Just take them together and make up whatever you wanted to teach, you know. Uh, you put the verses together when they really don't relate to each other. By the way, I know in the study Bible that uh, Dr. Rod Marker, Dr. Allen, and I did, the Nelson study Bible. I know there's a reference portion in each page. And references aren't necessarily bad. But it's very important when you go any cross-referencing to carefully check the context and the words found in any given reference that relates to what you're dealing with. References oftentimes are just simply uh, uh, unrelated concepts that simply are joined only by the fact that they have a similar word. So you did not review in this work the reference part? You just added no. the Okay. So that's no. the Somebody else did that and I have no idea how good it okay. is. But my experience is yeah. always check the context carefully. Oh. All right. <clears throat> Over specification. Uh, we saw above how Mormons, for example, advanced their theory of the pre existence of the soul by quoting Jeremiah 1 5. Um, are you familiar with that passage? Where God told Jeremiah that I knew you before you were formed in the womb? Yeah. By taking this verse out of context, they teach us, attempt to strengthen their argument by quoting one of their own texts from one of their standard authoritative works. By comparing these two scriptures, so called, their questionable work, plus the Bible. <clears throat> they conclude that Jeremiah 1 5 refers to the pre existence of Mormon souls. This is reading the biblical text what the text does not say. What Mormons have not proved is that Jewish thought throughout its history believed in the pre existence of souls in the Mormon sense. This is an alien concept forced onto the text, not one derived from it. You won't find any Jew anywhere who believed that, that souls existed prior to conception. This doesn't happen. So their strange doctrine really does reflect a Greek view of the world, but not a Jewish view of the world. <clears throat> Another example is wordplay. A classic example of this can be found in the writings of Christian science founder Mary Baker Eddy. She writes that the Hebrew word for Adam is Adama. By the way, is that true? Yeah. It's yeah. Adam. Yeah. Oh, that's right. so Adama is ground, isn't it? <coughs> <coughs> no. Which means red color of ground, dust, or nothingness. She might want to argue that a word that stands behind Adam is Adama, but it's, it's not. Adam is not Adam. Adam. <coughs> Out of her own imagination and probably no knowledge of Hebrew. <laughs> She devises a scheme for understanding this word in the mind science sense. I'm reminded, I, I, I won't mention names again on the tape. <clears throat> you can ask me other time if you want to know. <clears throat> but there's a popular Christian writer that just decries when he's found, and when people are arguing against his theology, he just says, it's not fair, you know, it's not right that you think that you know something because you know Hebrew and Greek. You know, you use that as a trump card to try to down, you know, downplay argument. And, and so he just goes on and on against the fact that you can know the Bible apart from knowing Hebrew and Greek. And yet, when it's necessary for a point that he wants to make, he'll say, well, the Greek word here means such 